Mr. Klein here with our first lesson of our chapter on atoms in the periodic table. This lesson we'll talk about the structure of the atom and then we'll discuss the periodic table, metals, nonmetals, and things like that in our third lesson. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's get started. This picture right here doesn't look too impressive. You just see a bunch of blobs and stuff. You're thinking, oh, well, Mr. Klein, this must have been taken with a microscope. You're correct. It's taken with a very special microscope because it's a very special picture. It's one of the first pictures of directly looking at a molecule. Those blobs right there are individual atoms bonded chemically to form a molecule. And really up until the past 30 years, we haven't been able to do this directly. So only until really recently have we been able to look at the atom and actually learn things about it. Everything we know about the atom up until then was done through indirect observation. We kind of did experiments and we kind of saw stuff that happened and that led us to make guesses about the structure of the atom. But only recently have we been able to look at the atom directly and find out information. So let's go ahead and let's dive into the atom itself. Now, we know that there are things called atoms. And we know that they're very small, but chemically, what exactly is an atom? So let's go ahead and let's define an atom, and we're going to draw a diagram of it. So make sure you have your color pencils and stuff handy. Okay, an atom is simply the smallest unit of matter, okay? Uh, without, once we get down to the atom and we go into the smaller bits of it, uh, we start delving into the realm of subatomic particles. And so for our purposes in sixth grade, we're not going to consider anything below that matter. It's bits of matter, but not matter if that makes sense. Okay, atoms consist of a nucleus consisting of protons and neutrons with electrons orbiting them. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's look at this. So we have an atom right here. It's not the scale. We have the protons in red, the neutrons in gray, and they're stuck together and they form the nucleus. And that general region I have colored purple, okay? So it's not like the protons and neutrons are inside this purple region. Rather, I'm just using the purple for you to understand that. And and this whole blue area outside of it is the electron cloud, okay? So these are, this is where the electrons orbit around the nucleus, okay? So go ahead and color this in and label all this. And as we go on, we're going to delve into a little more detail about each of them. Okay, so you can go ahead and pause it right now. I'm glad you've uh, unpaused it, so now we're going to keep on going with this. These particles of particularly protons and neutrons are made up of smaller particles. We call them quarks, okay? And there's six different types of quarks. We're not going to go into detail. Just know that there are quarks. And those are made of even tinier particles, which are made out of even tinier particles. And we go from there. And like I said at the beginning, the more and more we're directly observing uh, atoms and stuff like that, the more and more we're learning about them. Atoms themselves are extremely small. And like I said, we've only been able to directly observe them in the past 30 years. Only in the 1980s which isn't that long ago, kids, considering your teacher was born in the early 1980s. Uh, only in, since the 1980s have we been able to directly observe the atom. And as of yet, with current technology, we haven't been able to directly observe any subatomic particles. In other words, we see atoms, but we don't see individual protons, neutrons, electrons, quarks, strings, gluons, any of that, leptons, any of that at all. So... As technology progresses, we should be able to start directly seeing those, but it's going to take a while. Right now, we're just happy we see atoms, okay? So let's go ahead and let's look some more about the particles in the center of the atom. Okay, the center of the atom, we call it the nucleus. And within the nucleus, there are two types of particles. The first one is protons. Those are positively charged particles. And then we have neutrons. These are particles with no charge or a neutral charge. So what we're doing is we're looking at this area in the center right here. The protons have a positive charge. Those are the ones in red. Uh, the ones in gray are the neutrons with no charge. And they generally exist in this purple region, okay? Once again, this isn't like a purple ball that, that holds in the protons and neutrons. Rather, they're sitting together in the center of the atom. Now, protons and neutrons are actually held together. They're not opposite charges, so they don't attract each other. So why would a positive and a neutral charge hold together? Well, it's actually one of the four fundamental forces of the universe, and it's a force called the nuclear strong force. Okay, Those actually hold together the protons and the neutrons. And despite its name, nuclear strong force, it sounds really strong, right? I mean, you know, it holds stuff together. What's interesting is that even though we call it the nuclear strong force, 
uh, the force of attraction of the nuclear strong force only exists slightly past the surface of the nucleus. So you barely get past the neutron and that force does not apply to you and you're free to float around. Okay, so that's what holds them together. Now, when we talk about the mass of protons and neutrons in a nucleus, they have similar mass. The proton has a little bit more, uh, very slightly more uh, mass than the neutron. And combined, they account for about 99% of the mass of the atom. Okay, so 99% of the mass of the universe actually is just protons and neutrons. Okay, very little of it is actually electrons. And we measure the mass of an atom based on this mass of protons and neutrons individually, and we call it atomic mass units. Okay? Atomic mass units are the mass of a single proton or neutron. So if we say something has 10 atomic mass units, what we're saying is it has the mass equal to 10 protons or 10 neutrons. Okay? So and whenever we go into the periodic table and we talk about atomic mass units, this is where we get it from. Okay? So... What are the particles that orbit an atom? Okay, well, you saw that big blue region in the clouds. Well, what exactly are those? Outside the nucleus are negatively charged particles. We call them electrons. Okay, and unlike protons and neutrons, electrons are not made of smaller particles. Electrons are just electrons. And as a result, they are much, much smaller. In fact, it takes almost 2,000 electrons to equal the mass of a single proton or neutron. Okay. So electrons orbit the nucleus. Uh, you might see pictures on the internet of these nice, neat little rings that float around the nucleus, and that's where the electrons orbit. It doesn't quite work that way. Rather, they, they orbit in one of several energy levels very erratically. They are just kind of all over the place in these, uh, in these energy levels. And we use models of statistical probability in order to figure out kind of where they might be at at any given time. Because scientists aren't sh sh are never sure where they're at in any moment, it's said that the electrons orbit the nucleus in a cloud. So that's why in this picture that I'm going to show right here, okay, uh, this blue area, the electron cloud, what you have is you have several energy levels, and the electrons are like zipping around the nucleus, but we don't quite know where they're at. And actually, most of the atom is empty space, so you don't have like a gazillion different electrons floating in this area. You usually only have the equal number of protons uh, floating around in this area. So most of an atom is actually empty space. To think of it this way, uh, a, a football field and, you know, worldwide we could be talking about American football, soccer, rugby, or even Australian rules football. Uh, if we think of an atom as having that size, um, you could think of it as a rugby ball or a soccer ball or a football uh, sitting at, at the exact center of the football field, and that's the nucleus. And you have teeny tiny marbles, you know, like that are super small marbles, and they're zipping around in the outer parts of the stadium. And that would be kind of a kind of sort of scale model of the atom. So most of this atom right here is actually empty space. Most of you are empty space. Strangely enough, I'm mostly made of empty space. Okay, but because of nuclear forces and stuff like that, that's why they kind of stick together. And plus, there's so many atoms that make us up. So that's why there, you don't see like empty space when you're looking at a, something that's solid. So most atoms in a normal configuration have equal numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But what if an atom gains or loses an electron? Well, when this happens, the total charge of the balance changes, and the atom becomes what we call an ion. Okay, an ion is an atom with an electrical charge. So if we have three protons and two electrons, we have more protons, we have more positive charges than negative charges, so it has a positive charge. So there's two types of ions. First off are ions with a negative charge, and we call them anions. This is because the atom has gained electrons and has more electrons than protons. So if we have five protons, six electrons, it has a charge of negative one, and it's an anion. Okay. The opposite are cations, or ions with a positive charge. This is because the atom has lost electrons and has fewer electrons than protons. That's what I just said. So let's say we have five protons, four electrons. It has a total charge of positive one, and so it's a cation. You can think of it this way. The anion, the N is for negative. The T in cat is like the plus sign of a positive. So that's a really easy way for you to remember that. So those are ions. And there's one other special type of atom we need to talk about, and that's an isotope. Most atoms are actually not totally balanced. They can either be an ion or they can be something different. 
Many times an atom has extra neutrons that have been captured in the nucleus. Like a neutron just kind of floats around and the strong nuclear force, it bumps in, the strong nuclear force holds it there. Atoms with different numbers of neutrons but the same numbers of protons, we call them isotopes. All elements have different isotopes, okay? And actually most atoms exist in one form of isotope or another. Uh, and these isotopes can last for a very long time or a short time before losing neutrons. And this gets really complicated, so I'm just mentioning this to you. Some isotopes lose electrons at regular intervals. In other words, the neutron kind of leaves, okay? We call those radioactive uh, isotopes. And we'll mention that a little bit more in the periodic table, and we'll mention this a couple other times in the school year. But So that's just your first exposure to radioactivity. <clears throat> So anyway, so that's our lesson. Uh, just remember that atoms consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. The electrons orbit in a cloud, and we're never quite sure, so they, that's why we call them a cloud. Ions are atoms that have different, par, uh, different numbers of electrons and protons. And finally, if you have different numbers of neutrons, we call that an isotope. So there you go. That's the lesson. And if it is always, if you have any questions, please let me know. And thanks for watching.